enhancing intimacy in your marriage or relationship. And I'm taking my text from two scriptures. One is the book of John chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. John chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. And then we will flip over to the book of Matthew chapter 19, verse 1 to 9. Amen. So let's start with John chapter 2, verse 1 to 10. If you are there, say amen. amen. Okay, to be on the screen in a moment, but again, I encourage us to read from the Bible, um, from the word, the physical Bible. Amen. Um, okay, John chapter 2, verse 1. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Now both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. And when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servant, Whatever he says to you, do it. Now there were set there six water pots of stone, according to the man of purification of the Jews, containing 20 or 30 gallons apiece. And Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water, and they filled them, with, they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, draw some out now, and take it to the master of the feast. And they took it, and when the master of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, and did not know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew. The master of the feast called the bridegroom, and he said to him, Every man at the beginning set out the good wine, but the guests have, when the guests have well drunk, then the inferior. But you have kept the good wine until now. Hallelujah. Can we say that last part together? One to go. You have kept the good wine until now. Now let's flip over to the book of Matthew, chapter 19, verse 1 to 9. Okay, read and I quote. Now it came to pass when Jesus had finished these sayings that he departed from Galilee and came to the region of Judea beyond the Jordan. And, the, and great multitudes followed him, and he healed them there. The Pharisees also came to him, testing him, and saying to him, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? And Jesus answered and said to them, Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female? And said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then, they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no man separate. Then they said to him, Why then does Moses command to give a certificate of divorce and to put her away? And he said to them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, permitted you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. And I say to you that whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery and whoever marries her who is divorced commits adultery. Amen. Father, we ask that you brood over your word. May we encounter you in your word. May we see you. With unveiled faces we behold as in the mirror your glory. Indeed, let our faces be unveiled. Help us to see clearly. We want to see you on the pages of the scriptures. And our goal is to become like you. A heart like yours. That is what we desire. Our thoughts, our actions, our words. We want all this to conform to your image. And Lord, by the reason of this word, let us be truly transformed and let us become like you. That in the course of this sermon, let marriages be restored. Let, there be, let broken hearts be healed. Let every heart be removed. And let, let every walls in our marriages, in our relationships be pulled down. And indeed, let us, let two certainly become one. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 
Now, there are two occasions in the scriptures where Jesus had the opportunity to interact or to say something or do something when it comes to marriage. The first one happened in the book of John chapter 2 when Jesus attended, he was invited to a wedding that was taking place in Cana of Galilee. And the, two, uh, the, 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 the wedding has started. I can imagine you know, the, 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 the couple, they, was, they must have walked through the aisle. They must have sung the processional hymn or song. And you can imagine the, uh, the, the, the groomsmen and the uh, bridesmaid, they must, have, you know, do, they must have done their dance. You know how they dance in African weddings and all that. And then the, the priest must have you know, asked the couple to say, well, or ask the congregation to say that whoever objects to this marriage, to the joining of this woman and this woman in holy matrimony, if anyone objects to it, let them speak now or forever hold their peace. I also want to imagine that the priest must have said, okay, I join you both together in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and then, you know, I now bless you as husband and wife, therefore you may now kiss your bride. So I believe at this point before the wine ran out, the couple were now married. Because I believe that you don't drink wine just before the joining, you drink wine during the reception. Are we still together? Reception normally takes place, I think there's so much noise, can I switch to this? Amen. I think this sounds better. Now, reception normally takes place after the joining. So, the main ceremony, the main part of the ceremony had already taken place. And so, during reception, what would keep the marriage going was the wine. Because, because yeah, it was the wine. And at that point in time, the Bible says they ran out of wine. And then they approached Jesus. And they invited Jesus to that wedding. If not, the wedding would have ended abruptly. It would have just ended shortly. I mean, just like that. Because it was wine that would keep them going. And so they called Jesus and Jesus supplied the new wine. Now, can I say this, that from this story, we can learn, we can learn about three stages of marriage. The first stage happens when, the first stage is called romance. For example, the, two, the couple, they got married and the, the priest said, oh, you can now kiss your bride. And, you know, they, 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 they must you know, uh, they kiss your bride. So there's so much love between them. And it is at this point that people, you know, they can make lots of trips to the moon and come back. There's so much going on in the marriage at that point in time. There's so much joy. There's so much happiness. There's so much fulfillment. And that happens in marriage, perhaps right from the moment they get joined together to roughly about, according to statistics, about two and a half years. And then we can now move on to the second stage of marriage, which is called reality. Let somebody say reality. Now, this is when reality sets in, kicks in. This is when we begin to run out of wine because we discover that wine is over. This is when you have job challenges. Kids start coming in. Financial challenges. Different difficulties. I mean, we, are confront, we get confronted with different challenges and difficulties in life. It is at this point, reality, that you see your spouse's nakedness. Or wickedness, I mean, uh, what's weak, weaknesses, no wickedness, weaknesses, and you feel, uh oh, I'm not sure this is the person I got married to because the person I'm living with right now is different from the person I married when we said I do. And so reality sets in at this point. Now, again, it is at that point that the wine runs out. Can I submit to you, ladies and gentlemen, that the wine, or the, the wine that brought you both together is not sufficient to keep you both together. That wine will run out. The premarital love that you had before you got married, that love will run out at some point. The butterflies will die at some point. So what we need is the kind of love that Jesus, or the kind of wine that Jesus, only Jesus that will keep, that will keep your marriage going. Are we still together here? 
That is why you need to invite Jesus to your marriage. Because whether you like it or not, you will run out of wine. Premarital love is a kind of selfish or self-centered kind of love. After all, whilst you, you for, for the singles in the house, I believe you are looking for someone who loves you. If you are not yet engaged in a relationship, or if you are in a relationship but not married, your goal is that you are looking for someone, you want your partner to love you. Am I right or wrong? Hello, somebody. It's about what the person can do for you. The words, the lyrics, the things that are bad, the things they can do for you, that is what you want. After all, who would like to marry someone who doesn't love them? Hello. You wouldn't want to marry someone who doesn't love you. You want to marry someone who loves you for who you are. So the love, premarital love, is self-centered love. Now, I'm not saying that you should marry someone who doesn't love you. I'm going somewhere with this. But, you see, marriage, you will realize as we carry on in marriage, as we journey through marriage, because marriage is a journey, as we journey through marriage, you will discover that that kind of love, premarital love, will not sustain you. Because marriage is not what, about what you can get, but it's about what you can give. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. It's about what you can offer. And so, if your goal is about what I can get, that will run out. And then, when you now begin to encounter the love of Jesus, which is a selfless kind of love, a kind of love that is unconditional, unending, a kind of love that is focused on how can I please my partner? How can I give my, to my partner? How can I make my partner happier? Then... That is where you move from the stage of reality to relaxation stage. Are we still together? So we have romance, we have reality, and we have relaxation. So it was only after Jesus gave the wine that they were able to relax and the wedding continued. Chapter 4 verse 1. The Bible says, where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from des your desires for pleasure that were in your members? Now, Paul is not, or James is not speaking to members as in a company of people. He's talking about what is going on on your own inside. I call it ministry of internal affairs, the things going on within you. In fact, if you go to God's word translation of that scripture, he says, what causes fight and chorus among you? Are they not... Aren't they caused by the selfish desires that fight to control you? In other words, sometimes in marriage, what brings about conflicts, what brings about argument is about our selfish desires, the things that you want to do. Are we still together? Let me say, give an example. I was talking to a married couple, young couple, some time ago, and they wanted to... They uh, have a, a child and, you know, about, say, about two months or thereabout. So they just bought this dining, uh, a, a baby's dining chair, you know, dining table. And the wife put the chair in the living room. And the husband is saying, you know what, there isn't much space in our living room. Let's put this in somewhere. After all, the child doesn't need the table right now. Uh, but the wife said, no, no, I, I want it in the living room. Let it stay in the living room. The husband said, but there isn't space. After the child doesn't even need it now. The wife insists that this thing has to stay here. And then it became a major argument. A major argument. And at the end of the day, they, they fought and did all that. And then later on, the woman took the chair and took it to the room. So when the husband saw that the woman actually you know, yielded, he went to the room, took the chair, and took it back to the living room and said, this is how where it will be. At the end of the day, the lady won, or the wife won. Now, what is the lesson to learn from here? Because a lot of things that cause arguments in our homes is about what I really want. It's about self. What I, if it pleases me, then I'm happy. That is what causes a lot of argument. But at the end of the day, the woman, 
She yielded, and that is what true love does. The love, the kind of love that Jesus gives. If you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 6, actually verse 5, let's go there. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 5. 13, 5. Let's read. It says, let's start from verse 4. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. Is not puffed up. Does not behave rudely. Does not seek its own. Hello, somebody. So true love does not seek its own. Rather, it seeks to please the partner. Now, the thing about true, this kind of love is that the process of pleasing your partner, you please, you will find your own fulfillment. In fact, if you go to one of the criteria or characteristics of wisdom that proceed from heaven, according to James chapter 3, uh, no, James chapter 3, yes. James chapter 3 is that the love, that, the wisdom that comes from above is first of all is you is uh, is first of all pure, and then it's yielding. In other words, it yields to the other party. So, how yielding are you in your relationship? Do you always want to insist on your own will, your own desires, or you are after the desires of your own spouse? Singles, I want to advise you this morning. That when, you, when it's time for you make that, to make that decision, make a decision to marry someone, number one, who loves God, someone who fears God. Not only that, because again, someone who fears God, who loves God, and someone who is teachable and humble. Because the thing about marriage is that marriage is an institution of learning. We learn when we come to marry because the thing is, the Bible talks about, if you go to uh, First Peter chapter 3, the Bible says, treat your wife with knowledge, with understanding. So it takes not standing to lead a successful home. Relate with your husband with knowledge. Relate with your, or, or your, spouse, your, your husband or your spouse with knowledge and understanding. Now what if, now the question is this, what if you're the one giving in your relationship, but your partner doesn't seem to care? about what you're giving. What if you're doing your best? But it appears as though, you know what, you keep doing, but you're not getting anything in return. Now, this will lead me to the next conversation that Jesus had about relationship. Now, if there were only two accounts of Jesus speaking about relationship in the scriptures, then we need to pay attention to those two things. The first one was when he supplied wine, and that wine talks about the kind of love that Jesus gives. And we all understand that this kind of love is a selfless kind of love, is a love that is unconditional, is a love that is not self-centered but selfless, is a love that is unending. Now let's go to Matthew chapter 19. When they ask Jesus about divorce, they asked him, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason? And Jesus answered and said, have you not read? If I want to ask a question this morning, I asked this question two weeks ago. How many of you have read like five books on marriage in the last five years? Okay, just two hands up. How many of you have read two books on marriage in the last two years? Okay. What about one book in the last two months on marriage? Okay. Now, the Bible says my people perish for lack of knowledge. You see, marriage is not something you can work out by using what you know, as in by using your head knowledge. You have to research. You have to find out. It's an institution. Who becomes an engineer without being trained? Who becomes a doctor without being trained? Now, how can you become a husband without being trained to become a husband? How can you become a wife without being trained to become a wife? We have to learn. That's what the Bible says. Deal with them. Dwell with them. With understanding. And that understanding can be acquired through the reading of books. 
I've got so many books on marriage, on relationship that I've read again, and I keep reading, I keep developing myself, because the thing is that the more you know, the better you become. Because God is interested in who you are becoming in the process in your marriage. And that is what will keep your marriage going. Now, in Matthew chapter 19, Jesus said, Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female? And he said, For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. That suggests to me that the whole essence of marriage is for intimacy. Amen. That is the reason for marriage. If intimacy is missing in the marriage, then there can be no fulfillment. And when I'm talking about intimacy, I'm not talking about sexual intimacy. It's part of it, but that's not the whole thing about intimacy. I'm still going to be talking about different types of intimacy and how we can enhance such intimacies in our homes or marriages. Now, look at what Jesus said. He said, two shall become one. So verse 8, 6 says, So then there are no longer two but one flesh. Now, the reason for some I mean, conflict in our homes sometimes is because we are two people living under the same roof. We are not truly really one. I have my own desires. He has his own desires. I do my own thing. He does his own thing. I cook my own food. He cooks his, uh, you know, I keep my own separate account. And we do things, so I'm not saying you have your own individuality, that's right, but the thing is that you must find a way for you, for both of you to share or to have intimacy. Now, Jesus says something. When they ask him that why does Moses give the certificate of divorce, Jesus made a statement which is very crucial, and that is the reason for divorce in many relationships. He said, Moses, because of the hardness of your heart, permitted you to divorce. It was never God's will for people to separate. It was never God's will for people to divorce. But he said that because of the hardness of your heart. Another translation says, because of the stubbornness of your heart. If you go to any, another translation, I think contemporary English version of the Bible, say because you are so heartless. And that is why you divorce, people get divorced. Now, let's read that word very carefully. When Jesus said, I think he's making a bit of echo. If you can help adjust this, please. Thank you. Now, looking at what Jesus said, because of the stubbornness of your heart. In marriage, there are certain things that we find out about ourselves. Your wife finds out certain things about you, or you find out certain things about your husband. And you're making these complaints. You've complained about it. You've cried about it, you've lamented about it, you've raised it with your spouse, but they refuse to change because they are stubborn in their hearts. And because of this stubbornness of hearts, people begin to drift apart. One of the things that is wrecking or taking, stealing the joy of so many people in their homes right now is distraction. So many distractions around, social media, both of you, you've been out all throughout the day, or maybe you do morning shift, you do night shift, the time you come, you've come back together again, you're spending so much time on Facebook, and your spouse is sitting down there waiting for you to finish talking to external people, and they cannot come back to them. You are present, but you are not present. And that is a distraction in the home. Jesus spoke concerning Martha. He said, Martha, Martha, you are distracted by so many things, but one thing is needful. Mary has set for that thing, and nobody can take it away from, him, from her. What was Mary doing? He was at the feet of Jesus, sharing fellowship with him. A lot of us, we allowed so many distractions, to, uh, things to distract us from our homes or from our spouse. Now, again, your spouse may have complained about it, but because you refuse to change, at some point, they may say, you know what, let me just stop. Let me stop because I'm just tired of this. Again, they begin to drift apart. Am I making sense to someone here this, this morning? Yours may not be social media. Your own could be certain habits. Your own could be certain attitudes 
that you have refused to change, despite the fact that your, 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 your spouse has raised this many, many times. You know how the, the, Bible, the dictionary defines stubbornness? It says, showing dogged determination not to change one's attitude or position on something, especially in spite of good argument or reasons to do so. He refused to change. And Jesus said, that is the reason why a lot of people get divorced or get separated. Now, I really want to talk about how to enhance intimacy in your marriage. In other words, ways to enhance intimacy in your relationship or in your marriage. There are four things I want to talk about. The first one is friendship or emotional intimacy. Praise the Lord. The Bible says he that must have friends must first of all become friendly. A marriage without emotional intimacy is unfulf unfulfilling. And so how can you, both of you, come together in such a way that, you know, you find fulfillment in each other? There are so many people in the world today, they are so rich. They have fame. They have wealth. But they are so lonely. Hello, somebody. They are so lonely. Even married people are lonely. And they are lonely because they cannot find solace in their partner. And when we are lonely, you know, loneliness kills. The reason why you got married in the first instance was to like look for someone with whom you can share your life. Someone you can share your joy with. Or somebody to hold when you need to give a good cry over difficulties in your life. But when you need them, they are not there. The question is, can you make yourself available, more available for your spouse? You're working so hard, but you're not available. And by the time you get home, you're already tired and, you know, there's nothing for them to take away from you anymore. Can I help us or say to you this, I mean, this morning that make your marriage your priority. Connect with your wife. Connect with your husband. I'm talking about emotional intimacy. Many couples have stopped being friends. And how do you know if you have stopped being friends? Let's say two people are together and, you know, it's all quiet, it's all kind of boring. But when the wife sees her friends or the husband sees his friends, they start chatting and talking. And in fact, when the guy, when the guy laughs, you can hear his laughter all the way in London. You know, the guy laughs so loud, and that's because he finds more solace with his friends. But with his spouse, it's always arguments and issues upon issues. You stop being friends. The question is, what do friends do together? Hello, somebody. Remember how you started. And because of this separation, or you see, people don't get divorced in 24 hours, in one day. It happens. It doesn't happen overnight. It happens because people have been drifting apart. So the thing is, the Bible says where there's no wood, the fire will go out. But if there is wood, the fire will keep burning. So how can we keep the wood of emotional intimacy burning in our home such that if you have drifted apart, you can come back together again? Number one thing I want to share with you this morning is, number one, get rid of your resentment and hurtful feelings. Feelings of resentment, hurt, and anger will always constitute a noise in your relationship. Because each time you want to come close, you remember that thing he said to you. Remember, you recall that thing she did for, to you. And that hinders you from getting close to your spouse. Again, are you with me here this morning? You remember. And that thing hinders you from getting close. Why not talk about it? Talk about it. Now, when talking about this, you have to bring all these resentments, all these pains, hurtful feelings, you have to bring them to the table and discuss them. Now, when discussing this, be, be, be open-minded, listen to your spouse empathetically. In other words, listen and see things from their own eyes, not from your own eyes. 
Don't raise that shield of the fence. Listen to what they have to say. And then whilst you're listening to them, also if you're if you the one doing the talking, be respectful when talking and keep calm. That's what I want to say, keep calm. Be calm about what you're saying and just express your feelings to your spouse. And then find a way to resolve the matter. Not until all the issues, resentment, I mean, the feelings of resentment and hurtful feelings, not until they are dealt with in your relationship, these things will serve as a barrier to you growing together uh, emotionally. Number two, be grateful and show appreciation for their efforts. Let your spouse know that you are not taking them for granted. It's very easy, you see, as we go in, when the marriage, when the marriage is new, we celebrate ourselves, we cheer ourselves up, but as time goes on, we start getting used to the things that they do, and therefore we don't appreciate them anymore. We feel, well, after all, it's their job to be in the kitchen. Oh, after all, it's their job to do all the handy works and the, the DIYs in the homes, in the home, therefore, we don't appreciate them anymore. And the flame begins to die down. But make it a point of duty to appreciate your spouse. Be grateful for the things that they do. Number three, set some goals together. Emotional intimacy blossoms through communication. Share your dreams, your goals, your hopes, your plans. Talk about this. The more you talk about your plans, the more you grow together. Because again, you're having a future together. Now this is where you have to define your future. And if you're going to marry someone, ensure you marry someone who has a future ambition, not an NFA. No future ambition. That's why, because your future is about, you want to share your life with a person. So where do you see yourself in the next five years? You need to be able to share that with your spouse. Are we still together? Number four, take notice in what your spouse is doing and show interest. Hello, somebody. Take interest in what they are doing. If your spouse likes sports, take interest in the sports. If your spouse likes whatever they like, of course, that is something that is good. And of course, this should be within reason. I say within reason because sometimes when people, when it comes to football, some people, they don't have time for any other thing. They can watch football for five hours nonstop. Uh -huh. and I, I'm, so I'm saying within reason. And don't allow anything to take the place of your spouse in your life. I always say this to my wife, nothing will ever take your place in my life. And when I appear to certain things, I'm giving attention to certain things, I draw back, I call myself back to ensure that she's the most important person to me in this whole planet. And that is the truth. Praise the Lord. Number five, go on vacation together. Number six, create something together. Whether you cook together, or you paint together, or you do something together, all this is will enhance your emotional connection. And number, then also, the last one on this is create routines. Pray together. Go on a family retreat. Fast together. Create routines for yourselves. From the things you, it could be going to the gym together. It could be running together. Doing the more things you do together, the more you both will get connected to yourselves. But when you're always apart, it's risky. The flames will die. Nobody plants a crop and ignores it. In marriage, love is like a you pay. No plant grows on its own except weeds, and weeds are not useful. So if you want your plant to grow and to become fruitful, you have to water it, you apply manure, you have to nurture it. That is how relationship is. You don't just ignore your spouse and expect them to keep loving you forever. The love will die if you don't give the required attention. Let someone say amen. amen. I'm talking about enhancing intimacy. The second type of in intimacy is spiritual intimacy. Spiritual intimacy. God is love, the Bible says. And God is a spirit. If God is love and God is a spirit and we also are spirit beings, it means that love is spiritual. So to love your spouse adequately, you need to draw from God's love. Amen. Draw from God. 
Because sometimes, like I said, you see, this kind of love that you draw from God is unconditional. It is the kind of love that will make you go to your spouse, even though they've hurt you, even though they've disrespected, disrespected you. It is that same love that will make you to go back to them and make peace. Hello, somebody. But when that love is absent, you always want to like, you know what, if he doesn't talk to me, I won't talk to him. If he doesn't hold me, I won't hold him. If he doesn't say I love you, I won't say I love you. But it ought not to be so. For God commanded his love towards us. While we are yet seen as Christ came and died for the ungodly. This kind of love is unconditional. If you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 8 to 11. You see, love is like a, your relationship with your spouse. Put it this way. Marriage is a union not between two people. I'm about to change your theology. Marriage is a union between three people. God, you, and your spouse. Marriage is like a triangle. The apex of the triangle is God. And the two of you are at the bottom, the base of the triangle. Each of you must connect with God individually, and then you connect with yourselves. But if one person is connected to God and the other person isn't connected to him, you cannot have a, 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 a perfect triangle. That relationship will suffer. Will suffer because, you see, it will suffer. So it is important that you both connect with God and you grow spiritually together. If you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 8, if you're there, say Amen. Oh, come on, the house is quiet. Amen. Amen. First Corinthians chapter 13, verse 8. It says, love never fails. But whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. What does the Bible mean when the Bible says that prophecies will fail? Does that mean that when God gives a prophetic word, does that mean that the word will not come to pass? Nope. When the Bible says prophecies will fail, in Paul was talking about here is if you check the original Greek translation, it says prophecies will stop. In other words, I could stand here prophesying, and at some point I will stop because I have to go home. Hello. I'm here sharing knowledge with you. At some point, the knowledge will cease because we have to finish at 12 o'clock, even though I'm looking at what I have to share. I permit me, maybe five minutes after 12. Is that okay, everyone? At some point, it will cease. But the Bible says, love never ceases. It never stops. Don't ever stop loving your spouse. Love will not fail. Now, look at this. If you go to verse 11, it says, When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. Let somebody say put away. Childish things. Put away. Childish things. There are many children. Put it this way. Marriage is not for children. It's for adults. People who have been able to put away childish things. You know, one of the characteristics of children is that little, little things can get children really, really impressed. You inflate a balloon, you pop the balloon, and the child screams, yay! You know, little, little things can really get them impressed. So also, little, little things can really get them upset. Bumi, I remember my daughter and uh, you know, my son and daughter, you know, they're having an ag argument. David says, that thing is an excavator. Bumi says, he's a digger. Oh, David, no, he's an excavator. Now, they're talking about the same thing. Americans call it excavator. British call people, they call it digger. And so they keep arguing and before you, they start fighting. So little, little things get them upset. Now, in marriage, immature people or couples will fight over little, little things. What are the little, little things that make us so upset? You're upset because he, doesn't, he didn't call you. If he doesn't call, why not pick up the phone and call? Hello? You ask him, see him, he's not doing something. Why can't you do it? Or maybe you're upset with your spouse because he, uh, you asked them to do something for you and maybe they forgot to do it. I said, you know what, you forgot to do that. I, do that. I, it could just be that truly they forgot. Because sometimes life gets in the way and you get upset over them. 
Or maybe they asked you to do it and you say, because they forgot, you say, okay, why can't you do it yourself? Eh? You're asking me to do it. Why can't you do it? What is stopping you from doing the thing? And it becomes a big argument. Some arguments are really unnecessary. I thank God for my wife. You know, I, I think God just customized her for me. You know, God really, really customized her for me because, you know, I have a peaceful home. I live in a peaceful home, and I thank God for that. I'm a peaceful man. I don't really, I don't like wahala. I, I don't, wahala means problem. I don't have a problem. I don't have, I just want to know, go to work in the morning, wake up in the morning, give my wife a kiss and a hug, go to work, come back, give her a kiss, give her a hug, eat, and we'll go to bed, we'll watch movie together, we'll hold our slaves, we'll talk about different things, and then we'll go to bed, we'll sleep. That's how I want to live my life. I don't want arguing over and that's why we develop high blood pressure yes, hypertension because we worry and disturb ourselves over little little things say to them about grow up we've got to grow up and leave Paul said but when I became a man I left childish things hello oh come on church hello <laughs> another thing about children is that you know children where you talk about, I've talked about this before. You know, sometimes children can't, they can't hide their feelings. Let me say, let's say, for example, myself and my wife, we've talked about, uh, you know, Pastor Olu. And let's say we say something negative about Pastor Olu in front of Bumi. And, you know, I know Pastor Olu dearly, so that would not happen, you know, something like that. And, to see Pastor Olu, myself and my wife, who could pretend and say, oh, Pastor Olu, you know what? You are the greatest that ever happened to us. You know, we love you from head to toe, and we begin to, like, psych him up. Bumi could see Pastor Olu and not greet him and just walk past. Right? Because she's dwelling on those things that we have said against Pastor Olu in her presence. Now, people who are mature, immature in their mindset will relate with their spouses based on their weaknesses and faults. Listen, if God was to relate with us based on our weaknesses and faults, it would happen. Hello? I saw a post on Facebook the other day. I think it was yesterday night. And somebody was saying that if God would count, uh, if God does not overlook these, you know, when you, you, you're going through a website and you want to download something, you read the, they show you tick that you've read the terms and conditions. <laughs> So, a lot of people don't read it. It's the next page. So, the person now said that if God should count that lie, nobody will make heaven. <laughs> you know, if, God, if God does not overlook it, because we all do it. We don't bother to read the terms. And we just take you know, the thing. And, you know. Now, the point I'm trying to say here is this. Certain things, is, you see, I remember my... Before I got married, my boss then was married for 30 years. He said that one thing, the advice I will give to you, I love him so much. He said, love her weaknesses. That is the secret to it. For your spouse, yes, they have certain weaknesses. For you to live well, love their weaknesses and find a way. Now, I'm not saying... Especially things that are bad. If your spouse watches porn, and I'm saying that you should look, you know, porn in itself can destroy a home and all that. I'm not saying something like that, but I'm talking about weaknesses like, say, if, um, for example, I'm not a, a, I don't like paperwork. I'm not really a, someone who deals with paperwork that much. So, which is why I've said this before my email, I have over 60,000 emails that I have not deleted. Now, <laughs> If my wife was to get angry with me on that basis, who we'll continue to get angry forever? Because I'm not, I have other things to do to be, you know, deleting emails. I know some, for some, for some of us, it's so quick. You just do it, but I'll just use that time to do something else. I'm talking about things like that. But there are things, addiction, we have to find a way to break free from those things. Because those things are hazardous, they can kill or destroy our home. Are we still together here? We're talking about spiritual maturity, growing together. Now, how can you grow together? 
I w- I'm skipping a few things. How can we grow together? If you go to First chapter 2, verse 1, it says, Therefore, laying aside all malice. Let somebody say malice. malice. Does that sound familiar? You have an argument and you won't talk to each other. And that can go on and on and on. It's part of immature behavior in marriage. Why can't we just have an argument and sort it straight away? The Bible says, be angry. Do not sin. Cain, his offering was not accepted. He was angry. And God said to him, why are you angry? Watch it. Sin is knocking on your door. But he failed to control his emotions at that time. And then the, um, his emotions controlled him. He killed his brother. The, the, the third man on the planet. He killed his brother. So the Bible says, be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Nor give place for the devil. Each time you have, uh, allow anger to have its way in your life, you are giving the devil an open space in your life, in your marriage. Don't allow that. Don't ever allow the devil. Don't give him a room. Your wife, your husband is not your enemy. Your enemy is out there. Kick him out. So therefore, even if you don't feel like, like it, go to your spouse and reunite with them and pray together. Are we still together? Pray and cast that devil out. <laughs> Praise God. So laying aside all malice, all deceit and hypocrisy, envy and evil speaking, as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. Desire the milk of God's word. A family that prays together, they say, stays together. Share the word of God together. Share the word of God together. Listen, if you are in a relationship, if you are not married, and if you are in a relationship, if you don't uphold these principles of God's word, praying together, attending fellowship together, and defying yourself, if you don't uphold these principles, something else will take over. You discover that you start sleeping together. So you have to ensure that you uphold these principles in your relationship. In a relationship where there is God dwells there, in a relationship where there is love, see, God will dwell in that place. Whatever you do will prosper. Why? Because God dwells there. Amen. Point number three, talk about, uh, intimacy. I'm talk, I want to talk about um, relational intimacy. Jesus said, do unto others what you want them to do to you. Luke chapter 6, verse 31. You see, like I said earlier, after a while, the love, feelings of love begins to dissipate in marriage and the spark that was once there begins to fade away. And so how we relate with each other will help us to be able to fan into flames this, uh, you know, uh, this, the, the fan into flames that our love life. Now, a way to do that, to relate with ourselves, number one point is this, express your expectations. Should I close? Hello? Should I close? Okay. You know what? My wife is preaching next Sunday. (laughs) Praise God. Yeah. My wife is preaching next Sunday. So if not, I would have said, let me leave this and come back next Sunday. But my wife is preaching next Sunday. And listen, I know it's going to be awesome. It's going to be powerful. She is loaded and she has a lot to pass across to us in the house. Praise the Lord. Amen. So, let me quickly finish this. I promise I won't take too much of your time. Is that okay? Now, expressions. Now, many people have expectations in relationship. I'm sure when you got married, you had certain expectations. But the mistake we make is that we assume that our spouse has the same level of expectation or understanding. And so, when those expectations are not being met or satisfied, we feel frustrated. Am I making sense to you? So, expectations, therefore, expectations have to be expressed. Let them know your expectations. Let them know the things you desire, the things you want from them. Number one. Number two, feel your spouse's emotional What do I mean by that? 
When I say emotional cup, another way to look at it is emotional bank. Each time you appreciate your spouse, each time you appreciate your spouse, each time you make love with them passionately, each time you do something that pleases them, you're making deposits. It's getting rich emotionally. Even when you have conflicts, they have enough stamina to be able to bounce back. Now, each time you have accidents, you say unpleasant to them, you misbehave towards them, they want to make love to you, but you decline and all that and all that, you are deducting from them, you are withdrawing from them. Now, think about this. Which one happens more in your relationship? Do you make more deposits or do you make more withdrawals? If you make more deposit, your relationship will have that emotional stamina to bounce back. But when you have made withdrawal, any little thing will spark up an argument. You, want to, you can actually fight over any small thing. Why? Because you both are emotionally famished. Hello. Emotionally famished. So you have to find ways to fill each other's emotional cup, emotional bank. Keep making the positive. Say the words. Tell them I love you so much. Begin to express yourself to them how much you love them, how much you cherish them. And that way they get filled up emotionally. And then do less of withdrawals. And that way your relationship will, go, will, will, will get stronger. So fill each other's emotional cup or bank. Number three. Settle quarrels gently and in a timely fashion. Number four, think the best of each other. In other words, make excuses for one another. Give them the benefit of the doubt. Tolerate and accommodate one another. Yes, we're all human beings. Nobody's above mistakes. Therefore, when they make mistakes, forgive them and let go of it. Uh, number, number five, be mindful of the things you say to each other. Things like name calling, insults cannot be taken back. Even when you feel that you've forgotten about those things, they remember those things you say to them. Don't ever say to your spouse, get out of my life, leave my home, or I'm leaving this marriage. The more you say these things, the more you begin to condition yourself for it. And the thing is, it will happen eventually. The Bible says the power of life and death lies in the tongue. Instead of saying those things, why not pray? Instead, pray for your husband, pray for your wife, pray for your marriage. You are going through marital crisis. Have you actually taken seven days fasting and prayer to pray for your marriage? If you are really, really serious about keeping that relationship. Have you gone for help to say, you know what, I want to get my marriage back on track. Let me go for counseling. If you're really, really serious about keeping your marriage, then do the things that are needful. How many books have you read to, that will help you shape your character, help you shape your life, help you shape your vision? If you're really, really serious about this. Marriage is accomplished out there in the world. And that's the funny thing. A lot of us feed on rubbish, on garbages, on things, on, on social media, and those things inform the way we think. And sometimes we begin to see our spouses based from the light of the things we read on social media. And therefore, we bring those things into our home. Or we read about what the one woman did on social media that brought her husband on. And we go, I will try this in my home to see whether it will work. The only way to make your marriage work is this. The word of God. That is how I live. My wife and I will have an argument. I go to God. Lord, how can I do with this? Pray about it. Sometimes I wake up in the night, 3 a.m. I leave the room, go to the living room pray for myself, pray for my wife, and then wake her up. And then we can talk for like hours in the morning. Both of us, our eyes will be swollen on our way to work. But we've ironed out the issue. But before ironing out the issue, I've paid the price. I've gone to pray, seek the faith of God for wisdom. Like I said, everything doesn't have to be argument, argument, argument. There are ways to go about Get spiritual about it. Get to the root of the matter. Heat the iron when it's hot. I don't know. Let's carry on because I'm running out of words now. Let's go to the last one, which is physical or sexual intimacy. And that's the last one. And then I will go and take my seat. First Corinthians chapter 7, verse 4. 
Uh, do we have it on the screen? First Corinthians chapter 7, verse 4. It says, The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. In other words, you belong to each other. Now, the thing about physical connection is this. Before physical connection or sexual intimacy can become fruitful or rewarding, these three other intimacies have to be in place. Because how can you say you want to have a fulfilling sexual relationship with your spouse when there is anger and resentment in your heart? So you have to settle all those things. Now, one thing about physical intimacy is that maintain the touch with your spouse, if possible, throughout the day. Always connect with yourself physically is very, very key. The more you hold yourselves, for example, she's cooking or washing dishes, go behind her back and hold her. If you like, even you can part of her body, let, let her know that, yes, you love her and you cherish her. Whisper things into her ears or into his ears. The more you touch, you see, people who are in love make love all the time without making love. They make love all the time. There's always that connection. So let it be such that we, you're going out, hold your hands. You're going out, you're holding your hands, you're hugging yourselves, you can be in bed all time and just, you know, snuggle each other and stay in bed all day if you have the time. Praise the Lord. Physical connection is so paramount to make this work. Now, let's go to sex. How exciting is your sex life? Hello. Remember that sex should never be a secondary thing in your marriage. Keep sex as a priority in your home. Don't take it casual. Because some women will say, is it food? Eh? Is it food that you're hungry for it? But the truth is, that's how men are wired. Yes, it is food. Hello? It is food. <laughs> It is food. That is the truth. The question I want to ask is, who owns the home? According to the scriptures, who owns the home? The Bible says a wise woman builds a house, so the woman owns the home. If you want to make your home work, women, you have a role to play. Who owns the kitchen? Pardon? Say that, sorry, say, say out loud. The woman, yeah. The woman owns the kitchen. Now, I'm not saying that women always cook. I'm going somewhere. You see, the woman owns the home. Altar courts. The altar courts. The woman owns the kitchen. Holy place. Who owns the bedroom? Hello. Why are we talking like we are very, very spiritual people? You know? Who owns the bedroom? We can find it from the scriptures. If you go to Proverbs chapter 7, the Bible talks about though she was a prostitute, but this can also pass for the way a woman should talk or entice her husband. She said that I will lay the, by the tapestry on my bed. I will perfume my bed with myrrh, with cinnamon, and per, I mean, you know, perfume the bed. I will make it enticing for my husband to come. So listen, woman, you own the bed. Life to be is in your hands. Keep your ensure that your husband give him the best such that he would not be able to look elsewhere. Hello, somebody. You're talking as if you guys, you're talking as if you don't, you're innocent people. But what I'm trying to say here <laughs> is this you know, take yourselves to another realm, another planet. Enjoy it as much as you like because the time will come when you will not be able to do it the way you are right now, because engine can knock. Uh -huh. So now do it. Enjoy yourselves. Women, you, are the own, you own the bedroom. Own, you own the bedroom. Perfume yourself. The own, the, when you make up, make up is only men, not only men for outside, you know, going to work. By the time you come back home, everything would have wiped away. The husband won't see anything anymore. But in the night, take a good shower. Perfume yourself. Wear, or put on those bum shorts and all. You know, you know, and you know, make yourself look attractive to your spouse. 
wear the perfume, and your husband does the same thing, and just enjoy yourselves. The more you do it, the more your family, your marriage will grow. Are we together? You grow. Now, can I say this? Now, I know, yeah, I know the sisters are saying, yes, sir, yes, sir. This is not for you. Uh -huh. Wait for your time to come. Let me wait for your time. My wife and I, when we were courting, you know, I said, we said, we always agree together that we will keep ourselves pure. And the Lord made it happen for us. Keep ourselves pure. And the way to do it, it's not that the body was not shaking, the body was shaking, but the sin is, by the grace of God, we put it under control by the Holy Spirit. The Bible says, you through the Spirit mortify the deeds of the flesh. So be a spiritual person. Whereby your attention is on God and God, I want to remain faithful to you. If you are faithful to God, you'll be faithful to your spouse. Amen.